All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Connecticut's Old State House and to our historic courtroom. My name is Mariana Garcia, and I'm the Public Programs and Exhibitions Manager here at the Connecticut's Old State House. And I just want to thank you all uh, for joining us today for the third in our three-part uh, series, uh, which we have been doing in partnership with our friends at the State Library, the Connecticut State Library. Uh, the series is called The State's Filing Cabinet, and this installment is titled A Researcher's Treasure Trove. Today we are going to go into all the wonderful resources that are available in the library and all the great research uh, that uh, researchers can, can make use of and what wonderful treasures they can find in there and for, to do their research. Uh, today we are joined by three uh, staff members from the, the Connecticut Library, Susan Bigelow, Steve Mirsky, and Mel Smith. Uh, I'm going to introduce them in just a second, but before uh, we do so, uh, if you are watching online, please know that you can post your questions and comments in the comment or chat uh, sections of the video you are watching. And also, if you're here in person, if you have any questions, we are going to have a short Q&A uh, section at the very end. So at the very end, uh, just raise your hand and I will come with you with a mic so that uh, our friends watching online can hear the questions too. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let us begin. I will introduce our speaker. Uh, Susan Bigelow is a reference librarian working in the Government Information and History and Genealogy Units at the State Library. She is currently responsible for municipal documents and digital state documents. She has an academic librarian and she was an academic librarian and educator before joining the State Library staff in 2020. Steve, uh, Steve Mirsky uh, has been a law librarian since 1998 first with the uh, Connecticut Judicial Branch at Rockville and then at the Connecticut State Library's Law and Legislative Reference Unit. He supervised the library legislative bill room since 2000, tracking Connecticut legislation in the House, for, uh, in the House staff and providing permanent public access to legislative transcripts and other seasonal materials produced by the General Assembly. And finally, Mel Smith is a reference librarian with the History and Genealogy Reference Unit starting his career at the State Library in 1994 as a library aide in the cataloging department. Mel was hired as a reference librarian in 1996 in the History and Genealogy Unit after receiving his Master's in Library Science from Southern Connecticut State University and has been there ever since. So, quick round of applause for our speakers. Thank you for being here. And uh, please enjoy the program today. Thank you, Mariana, for that introduction. I'd also like to thank you all for coming out today. It's a beautiful day. Um, thank you for coming to this final um, section of the three-part series, um, State's Filing Cabinet. Uh, I want to reach out and thank the State Library Archives staff and the Public Records Office as well for all they've done in the previous two sessions. It really highlights what we do at the State Library and it preserves the culture and history and objects and records of the state of Connecticut for not only us to use but future generations as well. So it's wonderful to work with them every single day actually. So without them, we couldn't do our job, which I absolutely love to be able to do my job and show off what we have at the State Library. The mission of the Connecticut State Library is to preserve and make accessible Connecticut's history and heritage and to advance the development of library services statewide. By statute, the State Library serves as an official archives for the state of Connecticut, a permanent home of Connecticut General Assembly official transcripts and legislative bill files, and, maintain, and maintains comprehensive collections of Connecticut and federal government publications from the late 1700s to the present in support of the library's roles as a regional federal depository, library and the Connecticut State Documents Repository. The Office of the Public Records Administrator is responsible for designing and implementing a records management program for executive department agencies as well as the state's municipalities, political subdivisions, and certain quasi-public agencies as well. Today, joined by my reference colleagues, Stephen and Susan, we'll be discussing 
the State Library's role in opening up this wonderful, rich filing cabinet to government officials, state agency employees, researchers, and people like you, the general public. The best way to fully access and understand the scope of this collection at the State Library is spend some time at our institution to utilize the resources of our collections firsthand. And here we go. The Connecticut State Library. All right, let's see. Excellent. Come visit us. We love visitors. We love people coming to visit us near and far. We have people coming from across the world to visit the Connecticut State Library to use our unique materials. As a matter of fact, today we had a young lady come in from Edinburgh, Scotland to use particular materials from a state agency. So she came all the way from Edinburgh, Scotland to use some of our materials. So please come visit us. We just love it. We love people to come in to use our materials, even if it does take a road trip to see us. But some of the basics, I have to teach you, um, tell you about some of the basic things about our library. We're located in Hartford, Connecticut, on Capitol Avenue, across from the state capitol. Beautiful building, by the way. Our hours currently are somewhat limited, Monday through Friday, 10 to 2. We hope to expand our hours in the future. The State Archives, which is also in our building, their hours are 10 to 145. General phone number is available as well. Your phone call will be answered by a real live person from 10 to 2, and it will be directed to the property department. So that's why we have a general phone number so that you can be um, presented to the proper department. And people always, always ask me about parking. That's one of the first questions I always get at the end of a presentation. Where do you park? So there is metered parking around us and there's a couple parking garages nearby. So don't let that be a hindrance or concern. We can find a place for you. Now as an added bonus, the State Library also is home to the Connecticut State Museum. The Museum of Connecticut History, where it's hundreds of objects are on display, including the fundamental orders, which Lizette mentioned in the very first um, presentation. She mentioned this is a founding document, the fundamental orders, the original constitution for Connecticut. There's also the Connecticut Charter for 1662, also on display in the museum. Also on display in the museum are the Connecticut Constitution of 1818 and the Connecticut um, 1965 Constitution, which we currently run under. And here's an image of the um, fundamental orders, which is in the foreground. Behind that is the Charter of 1662. As you can see, the fundamental orders is only four pages in length. So sometimes public documents are short in length, but they're powerful documents. Just like, as Lizette pointed out in the first presentation, the Charter of 1662, even though it looks large, it's really three separate pieces of parchment put together. So wonderful objects, public records. The Connecticut State Library also houses hundreds of thousands of published items, books, seven floors of um, stacks, if you will. We have original manuscripts, hundreds of journals and magazines, either hard copy or online. Maps, maps, maps. We have tons of maps of Connecticut and of the country, the United States, colonial to current. We have photographs. We have the largest repository for Connecticut newspapers in the state. We have broadside and ephemeral materials as well. Wealth of materials for your use. But look, we're here to talk about access today with my colleagues. We're talking about how do you access some of this material. You don't necessarily need a treasure map to find the materials or the governor records, but you should start with the Connecticut State Library homepage, our webpage. When we go, before you go to any institution, a museum, library, archives, before you go, like that young lady from Edinburgh, they wanted to do their homework first. So they wanted to check what do you have, how can we access, access it, particularly when we have such limited hours currently. So you go to our website. On our website, you're going to be able to contact us through email or chat. 
You'll find audience links, department and audience links, special links to certain pages that you might want to investigate. The history and genealogy audience link page has lots of specialized subject matters. So if you're interested in African-American research, there's a whole research guide there. If you're interested in military research, it's there as well. Perhaps you're doing research on an old house. You just purchased an old house. Your family might not have lived there, but you want to do research on there. Once again, excuse me, you will find an actual resource guide that's going to be helpful. Our Primo catalog is there. What books do we have? What materials do we have? What can you access at the State Library or through the catalog? And we have, <coughs> excuse me, Archive Space, which is the archives search engine, which Susan's going to mention in the future of this talk. So our premier catalog, you can access from anywhere. And this is an image of it. Um, this is the advanced search um, page. And I just did a quick search for Hartford land records, because I'm interested in knowing what we have for Hartford land records. And sure enough, I found this entry for general index to land records in the town of Hartford from 1639 to 1927 in book form. Now that is really awesome. So we have this book. But it, if you look further down on the page, you can also see that it's available at the Connecticut Digital Archives. Now Barbara Austin talked about that earlier in the first session, where through the Connecticut Digital Archives, CTDA, Almost two million items have been digitized, including, seemingly, this item. So from our catalog, our Primo catalog, and in conjunction with CTDA, I can now access the, this actual book in the comfort of my own home. And in some instances, we also link additional items, not only through Connecticut Digital Archives, but also something the Internet Archives as well. So we're trying to get digital presence in our catalog. Also at the State Library is an actual catalog. This is our image of the Manuscript and Archives catalog. In order to access this catalog, you actually have to be here at the State Library. Lizette, in her talk, talked about the Trumbull Papers. Governor Jonathan Trumbulls was uh, the governor during the colonial revolutionary time period, and he gathered hundreds and hundreds of original do Connecticut documents, and they were bound in books. The only way to know about this wonderful collection, this manuscript collection in the archives, is by looking at this catalog. And you'll notice to the right you, is the actual catalog card for this particular item. So the archives has classified materials in this catalog. And the library staff will certainly search it for you if you can't use it personally. Now, how do you access material? In order to access the archives at the State Library, you need to get an archives card. Not a big deal. It's free, and I do love free, and it's good for a year. So all you have to do is come in with a driver's license or something that proves um, residence, and you can get an archives card. And this is a researcher that comes in quite often, and she's very happy. She has her archives, and she's in the archives seemingly looking at court records. Access to the Trumbull Papers. So here's an example. Using the archives card, I was able to pull the Trumbull Papers, volume 13. There's the citation. And now I have access to a 1780 letter to Governor Trumbull from a colonel out on the field uh, from the 20th Regiment. Now the Connecticut State Library in the history and genealogy area, State Archives, has a lot of different types of records. Now each one of these type of records, governmental records, I could spend an hour on each type of record, but I'm just going to and where they are and how they are accessed. But I just want to impress upon you the, the, the scope and the range of the amount of materials that the State Library has, including vital records, land records for Connecticut, 
and unique records like Connecticut Town or rate books. All of these materials could be used by a genealogist in doing their history, their family history. We also have a wide range of court records, which are also of value. Um, Connecticut County Superior Court records, which hold all kinds of civil, capital, criminal cases, divorces, naturalizations, name changes, inquests into untimely deaths, appointments to positions and offices, all kinds of wonderful things. County court records, which is a lower level of court. You have different types of civil and capital criminal offenses as well, and a lot of debt cases and a lot of naturalization records there as well. And lastly, Connecticut probate records. Connecticut probate records contain all kinds of things, including settlement of estates, guardianships, adoptions, um, bankruptcies, and insolvent cases and incompetent and say incapable persons whose estates had to be administered. So we have lots of different court type records that could be assist you in your historical or genealogical research. And there's also a lot of county and state created records that are deposited at the state library. Things like children's temporary home records. Those are homes where children were sent because their parents had passed away or they couldn't be taken care of properly. That was big in the late 1800s up to 1955. We have state and county jail records um, for certain counties and certain time periods, as, along with militia records. A lot of people come to the Connecticut State Library doing a lot of research on military service. Revolutionary War Service, Civil War Service, all kinds of different kinds of records. We have unique things like the 1917 pre-World War manpower census, which was done to, to gauge if we were to join um, the conflict in Europe in 1917, what could we supply? State hospital and asylum records. We have a great deal of those, though a great deal of them are restricted in nature. Uh, we also have a World War I military post-war surveys. Um, these were done, and an example is on the right there, of an individual who came back and filled out a service, four-page service questionnaire. Now, let's talk a moment about remote access. Now, FamilySearch, formerly known as the Genealogical Society of Utah, since the 1930s has been microfilming a great deal of records, genealogical and historical in nature. They have been to the Connecticut State Library in Connecticut towns throughout um, the state starting in the 1940s. So starting in the 1940s, they started microfilming things like town records, land records, probate records, vital records. All these materials we obtained a microfilm copy of. So it, Patrons could use them at the State Library. We have thousands of these microfilms. But what was mi microfilm is now digital. They are taking these microfilms and digitizing them. And you can access these materials, for the most part, with some exceptions, online through the FamilySearch catalog. FamilySearch and the Connecticut State Library are currently working together again, and they are currently scanning a a lot of materials, including the Connecticut Archives series, which Lizette mentioned in the first series, pre-1820 Connecticut government documents, divorce records from various counties, federal census records, coroner records as well. Very important to find out Connecticut town and vital records in some cases as well and registers from Connecticut State Veterans Hospitals and much, much more. We've also partnered with Ancestry in the past where they came to the Connecticut State Library and they also scanned various materials from our collections. And because we provided these materials to them, you can access them for free. If you go to the Connecticut State Library digital collections, you can create a free account to access these various materials, including Connecticut passport and birth certificates, military census, once again, military questionnaires, 
school age certificates, and various federal census records as well, and probate records, and so much more to come. They're scanning as we speak. Finally, I'd like to bring one last thing to your attention. The Connecticut State Library staff over the years have created indexes to some of these wonderful treasures that we have, including state prison warrants for the state prison. That would be Old Newgate Prison in Weathersfield. Connecticut death and marriage indexes. Inquests into untimely deaths. World War I questionnaires again, once again, those wonderful questionnaires. Comptroller Papa Records is a relatively new database that we created that indicate, that shows records of the Comptroller's office. And Connecticut Colored Troop Enlistments from 1863 to 65. This is our um, colleague, Kevin Johnson. He using some of these materials, these color enlistment troops records, and many of the other treasures that Lizette and her company has saved for us to create this um, person, person, personality, William Webb. William Webb was an actual soldier during the Civil War from Connecticut, and Kevin, using our resources, bring him to light. So, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to turn this now over to my colleague, Susan um, Bigelow. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Great. Okay. So I'm Susan Bigelow, um, and I'm going to be talking about a couple of things here. First, I wanted to talk about one other way you can access archival material. Uh, archives have a, a thing called a finding aid. Uh, which is a way for us to figure out what's actually in our massive archival collections. And our finding aids are now online through something called Archive Space. And I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna click on the link here and we're gonna take a look at it. And there it goes, fantastic, yay. Um, archive Space, again, it's a, it's a massive collection of all of, our, uh, all of our stuff is gonna be here. There's some simple ways to search this when you're looking for materials. The easiest way to start looking through archive space, you're gonna be tempted to use the search box right here right away, uh, but I actually recommend clicking on what this button here, classifications. What that's gonna let you do is it's gonna let you see all of the record groups that are in the library, and that's gonna tell you like what kind of thing is gonna be there. So let's take a look at that. I'm gonna click on show subgroups. And you see here, we can take a look at state government records first. So there we are, early general records, and then you know different departments, the judicial department, all of the different governor's records going back to the 19th century. And again, different departments, like the Secretary of the State's Department, the Military Department, uh, the Department of the Treasury, the Department of Environmental Protection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They all have different record groups in the state archives. Let's take a look at one. Take a look at the military department right here. And then I'm gonna be able to see what record, uh, what collections are in each record group. So then I can say, oh, I wanna take a look at Connecticut soldiers who died in Andersonville, which is the, the famous prison uh, during the Civil War. And then I could get some information about what's in that collection. Um, I think if you want to know more about these collections and what's in them, there is oftentimes, if I go back here, you want to find sort of the main or sort of home page for each collection. And there it is. It's just uh, these are all alphabetical. So here's military department records. In many cases, you will also find here, I'm just going to click on see more, you'll find a scanned sort of uh, finding aid which has a link to, which has a list of uh, what's in each container. So that can sometimes be a great help for figuring out what is actually here and what's where. But if you have more questions about that, if you see something that's on archive space that you want to know more about, get in touch with us. We'll be happy to tell you all about it and what's in there. All right. So again, some search tips for using archive space to find this material. I, I recommend using the classifications button there. If you do search, keep it pretty simple. 
um, maybe just one or two words. You know, don't expect to find something if you type in something very specific, unless you know like the name of a person. That can be a great search. There are also some filters that you can use that are up here on the side of the page. And like I said, that landing page for each collection can be extremely, extremely useful. All right. Now let's talk about government documents. So I work in, uh, I work half time in the government information department. Uh, I also work in the history and genealogy department with Mel. And so what I do is I am our municipal documents librarian. I also am the person who uh, collects and uploads all of the digital state documents. Now you can imagine that the state puts out just a ton, a ton of material. Almost all of it now is digital. So part of the State Library's job is to collect all this material and make it accessible to the public. And that's, that's part of what I do. So let's, let's talk about the three sort of strata of government documents that we deal with. We deal with federal, we deal with state, and we deal with local municipal documents. First off is federal documents. We are a federal depository library. We're part of the Federal Depository Library Program. And what that is, is it's a program that is designed to make sure that the public has access, free access, to the documents of their government. And so what we have here is we have tens and tens of thousands of government documents going back, again, to the 19th century. We have two very, very large floors of government documents available. Um, again, most uh, federal government documents, new ones, tend to be online, but the historical collection is all going to be in print, and that's what we have in the library. And this is something that we receive documents from, uh, from the Federal Depository Program all the time. Town documents. So let's go down to the bottom level. Uh, Connecticut's 169 towns also produce quite a lot of material. And so we have this great collection. Um, state librarians uh, of the past were very invested in getting as many town documents as they can. Uh, in fact, here's a letter. You might, can't really see it that well, I, I suppose, but here's a letter from the town clerk in Stonington and, uh, to uh, state librarian George Goddard. And uh, he's saying, here is, uh, here is some material that we have and he's at the, my favorite part of that is that he says that uh, you know, he's, there's records in the first volume of, uh, of their, their town records, but he can't read it because the alphabet is too different. So there is actually, by state statute, uh, towns are required to send us their official publications. And what are those official publications? Well, they, they kind of fall into two, two categories. Uh, charters and ordinances. Now, a charter for a town it's kind of like the Constitution, like a mini Constitution that runs that town. Not all of our towns have a charter. Some of them are simply run by state statute. Uh, but those that do have charters, they can amend those charters and change them whenever they want to. That's what the Home Rule Act of 1957 did. Ordinances, of course, are like, that's what the legislative body of the town does. It passes laws, ordinances that the town can control. To look up charters and ordinances, we have a, a guide that we put together here. And you can find this on our page. And just, I'm just going to show you what it looks like. Each one of the towns has a shelf list. Let's just take a look at Berlin, because here we are. And that's what it looks like. It's, uh, or, it's organized by year. And it's going to give you an idea of what's there. And this is all on the second floor of the library. Um, it's just all publicly accessible here in our stacks. All right. The other kind of town document is official, other official town pub publications. And these can be things like a town report, like an annual report. So, Back in the 1800s, towns started to issue these financial reports so that the citizens would know what their, their town government was doing. And over time, in a lot of towns, these morphed into these gigantic, uh, interesting reports that reported on all the sorts of things that the town was doing, from like paving roads to uh, the almshouse where the, poor, uh, where the poor who couldn't take care of themselves were, um, to schools, to all kinds of other things. To find official town publications, once again, I've got a, a guide here. 
And same deal. Uh, let's take a look at Hartford, actually. I'm going to go right here to H. Hartford. Hartford, because we are located in Hartford, we have a huge collection of official town publications from the city of Hartford. We have just a ton of stuff. Um, and that ranges from city budgets to high school yearbooks uh, to financial statements to uh, reports of the various departments, like the Parks Department produced these really interesting reports, um, to all kinds of other stuff. Really pretty interesting stuff, if you want to take a look at that. I once had a question from somebody wanting to know about um, what the fire department was doing and how many fire calls they had in, 18, in the, the late 19th century. And that information is there. It's great. Now, these can also be used if you are interested in genealogy. Town documents are actually pretty good for genealogical research because you can find the names of people in them. And just giving you some sort of ideas of what you might find there, here's a list of students who were perhaps enrolled in a school at a certain time. Here's a list on the other side there of people who were in the police department of Meriden. Uh, this is one of my favorite documents. This is a report card um, from 1847. And this was, it's actually part of our town documents collection. We don't have a ton of these, but, whoever, but somebody did give us uh, these, these are actually from now East Hartford. Um, and this is uh, Delia Ann uh, Treats uh, High School uh, Report Card. Um, it says at the bottom there, greatest possible merit, right down here under remarks. She did very well, good for her. Um, but this, and you can see all the different things that they, they were sort of grading her on. This is a very cool piece. I like this one a lot. But that's the kind of thing that you might be able to find, and you might be able to find some interesting genealogical information in there as well. All right, let me head back to the show. So, lastly, state government documents. So again, these are the publications of the state and publications of state agencies. So we have a comprehensive collection of these, again, stretching back to about the 1850s or so. Older materials than that are going to be in the state archives. Every state agency is required to send us copies of their publications. And that now includes digital publications. So how many of you want to guess if they actually all do that? They do not. <laughs> And so sometimes part of my job is to go out and, and find these documents, to bother people for them, to get them any way that we possibly can so that we can preserve them for the future. So the print collection, again, stretches all the way back to the 1850s. Um, we are still getting some print materials now, but most things are, are going to be available online. They are searchable through our online catalog. There's also a couple of indexes out there, not, not too many. You can find them on our government documents page on the website. Digital state documents, though, that's where all of the growth is right now. And these are stored in our Connecticut State, uh, the Connecticut Digital Archive. And our state document collection there has tens and tens of thousands of documents that get uploaded. I know hundreds and hundreds of these get, get uploaded every month. Um, they are constantly issuing reports and other material uh, all of the time. So it's a, a challenge to try and stay on top of that to make sure that we are actually preserving as much as we can. This again is going to be searchable through Primo, our catalog. All right. So that's our government documents, and I'm going to, trans I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Okay, so last but not least, um, the uh, State Library's law collection. So um, we're known as being the principal law collection of the state. And what does that really mean, you might ask? That, that means that we um, keep almost everything as far as 50 state uh, cases, statutes, what have you, uh, legal treatises. Um, a lot of treatises that we have, treatises are legal books. They're, they're based on subject. So like if people are researching a legal topic, they'll go specifically to a title that deals with that subject. 
Now, in today's world, it's mostly digital, either through Westlaw, Lexis, mostly commercial databases. So that's like one aspect of what the law collection is. The other aspect is the historical side to it. Like people often want to delve into the past to see why laws might have been passed in, you know, leading up to the current laws that are in effect now. So that's like one thing that um, people want to dig into looking backward, but a lot of times they need the up to the minute case that's been decided that hasn't been overturned. So it's kind of a, a two-edge two research. It's like cutting edge and also historic. So we keep a lot of materials that other law libraries don't keep. Um, there's other law libraries throughout the state, like in the judicial branch has uh, courthouse libraries in every uh, courthouse across the state. So they have a lot of what we do, but I think what distinguishes us is we keep a lot of runs of material that they would just get rid of because they don't have space. So yeah, we retain, provide permanent public access, like I mentioned, to previous versions. So like when I talk about previous versions, it's like everything for Connecticut statutes as an example back to the 1700s, like all sets. So if somebody wants to see what it looked like back in that time period, they could just pick up the book. Or we do have some in our digital archive as well. So in some instances, this is statu statutorily mandated, but it mostly falls under a collection development policy and mission statement. So there's certain items that are covered by statute. Um, a good example is um, records and briefs for Connecticut Supreme and Appellate. So we do keep those, um, and I'll show you pretty soon about the different formats. So each of these following resources that I'm going to show you have like a unique set of circumstances surrounding their availability, both in paper and digital. So it's, it really depends on the title. Like sometimes it's better to use digital, other times you really need the paper, other times it's a mix. It depends on, on the time period. Yep, so the first item, like I mentioned, case law. So that's a given if you're doing legal research. Um, we have all 50 states and uh, federal jurisdictions. We also have prior years for all, all those states as well and at the federal level. So we have that in paper, but right now it's available in all these major databases that I have listed, like Westlaw, Lexis Advanced. Fast case, which I have listed, is actually available remotely. So if you have a library card with us, you can access this from home. And you can do case law research just as well as you would in Westlaw or Lexis. So that's a big plus for us. Um, so yeah, paper and, and um, digital is about even. It, for this type of material, it's about the same. So yeah, so now we move on to statutes. You have case law and statutes. Those are the two main areas of law that people want to look at for research. So for availability for that, we, we have a mixed bag. So we have like uh, Hine Online, which is a good resource for historic documents as well as legal. Um, like as an example, we have back to 1784 up to 1949 for Westlaw. 1988 to present for the General Assembly website, so they they don't go back too far. They're not their their focus isn't historic. They're more, you know, posting what they're producing. They try to keep things on their site, but we can't be guaranteed that they're going to keep it forever. So that's why we take it upon ourselves to archive a lot of this, um, and it's also incomplete. Like they don't have all versions for for the earlier years. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. For us in, in print, we go back to 1784. So we definitely have all, um, all versions in print. We have also scanned them into the digital collection up to 1930, I believe. So we're, we're making progress, but we're, we still have a ways to go for scanning. All right, so. It's another example here, Connecticut House and Senate journals. Um, for what we have in the law collection, 
in print. It goes back to 1837 for House and 1840 for Senate journals. So what these journals do is they outline what happens each day during a legislative session. They still produce them, they still print them, uh, but they have them posted online now on the General Assembly website, again back to 1988. But um, they, they definitely outline like every action done. It do, it's not the actual transcripts of what they're talking about, we'll get into that pretty soon, but it's more about each action taken whether they've done a roll call vote, whether they've introduced amendments, all of that's outlined in these journals. Um, and the limitation of the paper is they don't come out right away. Like they just don't print them. We, we might wait two years for them to come out. So there's no option. We have to use what's online for a period of time. But we still get it and we keep it for that purpose, just for posterity. So. <laughs> I know Susan talked a lot about government, uh, state, and federal documents. In the law collection, we do have some state um, documents, uh, mostly administrative decisions that were, are put out by different agencies. Um, there's a lot of decisions that are made either by the attorney general, whatever agency, and I outlined two of them. I, I picked two key examples out of our collection. You could kind of see a picture of what it looks like in the stacks there. It's, could be daunting for a first time visitor just to like find what they need, but there is a rhyme to the, a reason behind the organization of it. So it's organized pretty well. But yeah, I picked these two examples. So one is the attorney general opinions. Um, and as you can see, there's different um, periods of time that different databases cover for them digitally. Um, but we go back to 1899. So that's a pretty deep dive for paper, but we don't get it anymore in print. In 2010, we stopped getting it, so there's no other option. We, we have to somehow digitally archive them. They're available in all these different places, but there's, there's no consistency. Um, so we're hoping to be able to do that in the future. The other um, item I picked is Freedom of Information Commission decisions. Um, those are available online back to 75, which is pretty good. That's a good run. But if you go on their website, I could go there and kind of show you what it looks like. Some of them are not easy to use. Like, they're there, they're digital. Oh, did I not click on that? Oh, how do I go back? Thanks. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try to go into this. Okay, so like if you're doing a, a keyword search, say you wanna find decisions within all these years on a topic, it's, you can't do it. You have to click into each year. Um, I'll just pick a year just as an example. Then you go in there and there's separate links within what they have posted, so it's, it's not easy to use. It's great to have it available online, but you know, if you're researching a topic, how are you gonna find what you need? So that would be something if we pursued scanning and making it available digitally, it'd be easy to use so people can access it for research purposes. I'm just having troubles getting back to the presentation. Um, is there, yes, sir? I'm trying to get back to the presentation. Oh, okay, thanks. Oh, 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I know bill files were mentioned in the summary at the beginning of this presentation. That's another flagship collection that we have. Um, so we go back to 1911 for print, um, and we have a lot of these files and ca um, cabinets, file, classic file cabinets and file boxes that you see right there. Um, but they're, they're not as accessible as if they, you could search them, so that's another problem. Plus, they're not in the best archival setting. Back in the day, we wanted to keep them separate from archives for, per, for people to access them quickly. The downside to that is they weren't preserved well, so they're, they're kind of um, crumbling. We want to beat the clock and scan some of the years that are in bad shape, so we're doing that. Uh, we do have select earlier years in our digital collection along with um, 2022, which you know, last year, moving forward, we're, we're just uh, archiving them digitally at this point because there's more available digitally than there is in paper. So this is a good example of like, it doesn't pay to deal with the paper for this item. It's, it's, there's a lot more available on the General Assembly website and on their server. So we're, we're pursuing that at this point. Another um, resource that we have are the bill history cards. So those outline all the actions on a bill so those are specific to the bill. Remember I mentioned um, House and Senate journals are specific to the session, but these cards focus on each bill that was introduced during a session, and those go back to um, 1911 for our cards, you know, matching up with the bill files that we have available. Um, so they, you know, a lot of bills, they don't go anywhere, so there's not much information on the card, but then there's others like I try to get a picture of one that actually shows that there was a lot that happened. So back in that time period, they would hand write the actions in there. Kind of looks like a, doesn't even look like a ballpoint pen on how they wrote it in. So it was way back in that time that that's how they kept, kept track of that information. Now it's late, a little later on, they came out with the legislative record index. That was back in 61. So that outlined the same thing that we would put on these cards for the most part. Um, but not everything. So we kept producing the cards up until, um, what was it, 82? Um, at that point, or I'm sorry, 2008. So then at that point, we noticed that it wasn't worth doing anymore. Um, uh, so, so then now what we are doing, uh, there's somebody on our staff in law that's uh, scanning and posting these into a database. Um, so little by little adding them that you could actually search them. And I'm going to click into it just so you could see it. So you could search legislation if you have a, uh, why isn't this working? There we go. Yeah, so you could you know, focus on different specific items to search and pull up the information that way. So it's helpful for doing historic research, but like I say on the General Assembly website, they have under bill status for each bill, they show a lot of this information at this point, but they don't have it for earlier years, so this is invaluable. Okay. And then the last item I wanted to cover are voting records. Those are actually valuable because they, um, they're not available anywhere. These are not available at any other place. They're not online because um, the General Assembly doesn't want to post them online but they aggregate a particular district for each year 
like say your legisl your state uh, representative or senator, it outlines all their votes on all the bills that were introduced during that year. So we go back to 1990 for House and 1988 for Senate. Uh, we, we stopped getting them in 2019. I think it's just because of the pandemic that they haven't gotten around to sending us material again, but they still send it to us in paper, but then we have the discs as well, like they send it to us on CD-ROM. But um, this is really valuable because you really can't get voting on, in one spot for your legislator all in one binder. Um, you can get roll call votes in journals, like in the House and Senate journals that I showed you. Um, you can see the voice votes, but they're not going to be specific to outlining what each legislator did. So if it's a voice vote, forget it. It's not, you're not going to know unless you look at this. So I'm hoping that they make these available digitally because I really feel it's a valuable service to citizens. I mean, you're electing these officials. You should be able to see how they're voting. But I think their concern is that the media would contort you know, their, their voting record on something. They might like focus on something and twist the intent behind why they might have voted a certain way. That's the explanation I've been given. I'm not sure how valid that is, but that's, that's what I've been given. So now we're around to the question time. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Susan, Mel, Steve. That was really, really fun. And uh, just makes me want to go in there and start doing my own research, really. Okay, so we're going to open it up for questions. If you have any, please uh, just raise your hand and I will come to you with a microphone. I'm also keeping an eye on uh, the streams online, see if any questions come through there. So, yeah, any questions here from in person folks? Is there a is there a collection of shape files like digital map files in addition to perhaps maps um, in any of the collections? I see on. Okay, um, not in our collections. Uh, there are places that do have that, um, like the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection has a lot of shape files. Um, there are some others that do as well. It depends on what you're looking for. Uh, if you're looking for like legislative districts, the census actually has those. Um, so they are in a bunch of different places, but not not necessarily the state library. We don't have them at this point. Good question, though. All right. Anybody else? Let me take a look online. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he answered all the questions they could possibly have. Oh, all right. What's the toughest genealogical question you've ever been asked and helped to research? <laughs> I'm after some Smiths. <laughs> they might have come from Connecticut. <laughs> no. Um, we, do, we do get a very general, broad question sometimes. I'm after um, someone named Clark. Usually there's certain surnames that are problematic, of course, Smith, Jones. But um, quite often people don't have the information. Or they try to connect famous individuals to themselves. That, that happens quite a bit. And sometimes there is a kernel of truth to the, the family stories that are out there. Um, but it's always wise to work with yourself and work backwards. Um, we receive amazing questions almost every day. That's why I love being a reference librarian personally. People come in once again from near and far, and you don't know what they're after. And one of the treats for myself, and I can also probably speak for Susan, because we do work in the state archives, um, is watching people come in and access materials that we've never seen before. 
I've been there 27 years, and I think uh, the state archivist, Lizette Pelletier, could also um, agree with the statement that there's so much there. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any questions coming in from online. So, oh, oh another one. <laughs> So I work in the private sector and in government relations, I'm frequently submitting Freedom of Information Act requests all over the country to different government agencies. Um, so I'm sure there are a lot of state employees coming in doing research in your library. If I were to craft a better FOIA or a better uh, inquiry to the government, would there be any pointers that you would have to say like, hey, you should really be asking for this because it'll help them find the right box or the right drawer or the right file. Uh, do you have any like just general pointers to help make a request go more smoothly and also hopefully bring the cost down if there's a cost that the state comes back with? Ask us first. That's what I'd suggest. Uh, if you've got something that you want to know about, uh, sometimes these information that you're looking for is buried in a report somewhere and we can find it for you. Uh, and the FOIA process takes time. Uh, so if you have something that you're after, you know, give us a shot. Uh, it's possible we could find it for you and save you a little time that way. But that's, that's my major advice for you. Thank you. All right. We do have one question from, um, we do have two questions from online, actually. One comes from Colleen on Facebook. Are the general population voter registrations available? Voter registrations, uh, that is a town thing, town by town. Uh, we do not have them. The town clerk for each municipality will have that information, voter mm -hmm. registration information. Mm -hmm. So you have to go to each town to get yep, it. Yep, there is no centralized, mm -hmm. not that I'm aware of, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that each town clerk you'd have to talk to for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we may have some historical ones, but if we're talking about current stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right, awesome. And also we have one from Brian. Also on uh, Facebook, what is the most underutilized tool that you have available? <laughs> well, um, my former unit head of the History and Genealogy Department always considered Percy as one of the underutilized resources. Percy is, of course, a, a type of index to thousands and thousands of articles, um, scholarly articles, um, that point people to little articles that someone might have written about a specialized topic, mm -hmm. usually of a historical or genealogical nature. So quite often he would say, and I will echo something like Percy, or Percy. an index mm -hmm. to um, secondary sources. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the secondary sources will lead you to the primary source that you really want. Right. So check out Percy, folks. <laughs> okay, and also another one from Brian. We have one uh, more. What is the biggest takeaway you'd like today's viewers to leave remembering? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the biggest takeaway that I would uh, hope that people would, would, uh, would take is that the information about what your government is doing, that's your information. That belongs to you. That belongs to the people. And it's available for you. That's what the library is here for. So please think of us when you have questions about what your government's up to, because we can help you find those answers. Yeah. It's up. Okay. Um, we're, yeah, just remember also that we're constantly working to make these available in a, in a way that it's useful to you. Like, we're not just harvesting information, whether it be digitally or storing it away in paper and squirreling it away. Like we're, we want to make it so it's accessible and that people could use it for the years to come, not just right now, but looking into the future. Mm -hmm. I would just add that we are each information specialist and we're here to serve the, um, our patrons in the state of Connecticut to connect to the document or the information that they need or they, they, they want. There are many times that I come to Susan or Steve because they have information that I don't have. So um, we're 
a group of individuals out to help people find the materials they want. Okay, I think we have time for one last question, uh, also from Facebook. Do you ever welcome groups of students to the State Library? Are there opportunities for a class to have an introduction to the archives and do some research themselves? Uh, the History and Genealogy Department often has two little um, groups, um, select groups that come through. We often give orientation tours about our materials and access, just like we did, did today. Um, so yes, um, we do invite people to come in. Um, because of our limited hours now, it's helpful if individuals reach out to us beforehand so that we can coordinate better. Um, but certainly, um, we have a wide range of materials um, through the three reference units. All right. Okay, thank you very much. This was wonderful. I know here at the Connecticut State House, we use references from the library all the time to prepare our programs, prepare our uh, school programs, our exhibits, uh, our interpretation, all sorts of things. So yeah, this is just an invaluable research that we have, an uh, invaluable research resource that we have here in the state of Connecticut, thanks to the State Library. So I want to give you a quick round of applause. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. And again, this was the third in our uh, three-part limited series for the spring, the state's filing cabinet. All of the programs are available on YouTube and on our Facebook pages. So if you'd like to watch uh, the old ones or maybe re-watch this one as well to take a look at all the, the, the places you need to go on the website, those are available on our YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, I do hope that you join us again for our future programs. All of those are listed on our uh, events page on our Facebook. And also check out the library's uh, website to see what they've got going on. Uh, and yeah, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you for coming down today. Mm -hmm.